Welcome. In this video, I'm going to talk about Section 6 from Chapter 15, which looks at the environmental impacts of the pharmaceutical industry. So just like medications may have side effects for the patient, the production, administration, and disposal of medications produces side effects to the environment. And it's equally important to monitor these practices of the pharmaceutical industry. Green chemistry, or sustainable chemistry, was developed around 1991, and it focuses on 12 principles that seek to reduce the footprint of the chemical industry while improving safety. So it has many applications in all industry, and including the pharmaceutical industry. The main principles are to avoid waste, maximize raw materials that end up in products, so increase yield, and use safe practices. Most drugs are complex molecules which are synthesized and extracted in multiple steps. So extracted means something's being left behind, and that something is usually an organic solvent. And these solvents may be toxic and then are left over at the end of synthesis, leading to the problem of how do you dispose of them. Solvents are by far are the biggest contributor to the emissions or waste of the pharmaceutical industry. And the disposal right now for far too many companies involves incinerating or burning it, which can release toxins into the environment. So it's really not disposing of it very responsibly. So when looking at a solvent to use, pharmaceutical companies should look at the suitability of a solvent by assessing three different factors. The toxicity to workers, is it carcinogenic or harmful in some other way? The safety of the process, is the solvent flammable, explosive, or can it cause toxic byproducts and harm to the environment? Is it going to cause harm to the soil, the groundwater, or even the atmosphere, such as ozone depletion or producing greenhouse gases? So using these criteria, solvents have been rated as preferred or undesirable. Things like chlorinated compounds, which destroy the ozone, Ethers and aromatic or benzene-based compounds are all problematic and less desirable. And currently, you might remember, benzene is used a lot. On the other hand, water, alcohols, and some esters are a much better choice. And thinking back to organic, it's possible to change most of those undesirable compounds into a more desirable compound. Another factor is to reduce and reuse solvent to decrease the waste and cost. If your solvent is left over, rather than just disposing of it, you could reuse it in the next uh, batch that you make. Another waste issue for the pharmaceutical company is nuclear waste, and this is mostly in diagnosis and then treating some diseases, and it continues, continues to be a growing field, especially as we use radiation for more and more diseases beyond cancer, and cancer continues to be a growing problem. So this means an increase in nuclear waste that needs to be disposed of. And nuclear waste is um, categorized as either high-level waste, and it should be HLW, not HWL, or low-level waste. And it gives off large amounts of ionizing radiation for a long time or gives off small amounts of ionization, ionizing radiation for a short time. Fortunately, most medicinal nuclear waste is low-level waste, like clothing, shoe covers, paper towels, implements, things that have been used. So, um, for example, the protective gear that the radiologist might be wearing as they're doing the diagnosis, the things they drape over the patient. So these things are all radioactive for just a short time. So what they do is they store it in a sealed container for a few days or a few hours until it's safe to dispose of in a conventional or traditional method. The high-level waste is a little more problematic. It's usually spent isotopes from diagnostic techniques, and it's usually very toxic, and it's going to remain radioactive for a long time, and it's going to generate a lot of heat as it's radioactive. So it's typically stored underwater for five to ten years and then transferred to dry storage in heavily shielded structures buried deep in the earth, much like we do with the spent isotopes from nuclear reactors. But the amount of high-level waste for medicine is really quite small compared to that generated by power plants. Another big issue of waste is antibiotic waste. We mentioned earlier in this chapter that antibiotic-resistant bacteria, or superbugs, have become a huge problem of all antibiotics, not just penicillin. 
And these superbugs carry several resistant genes and cause infections that are really difficult to treat. And one of those is the methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus. So it's uh, called MRSA, and you maybe know somebody who has uh, developed this, but they get a staph infection from this particular bacteria, and it becomes very, very difficult to treat that staph infection. So it usually infects a wound, it can go on to cause pneumonia and blood poison, which can get very serious very quickly. And the issue is that normally only a small number of bacteria should have this resistance, but the large-scale production and use of antibiotics has changed out that we are seeing more and more superbugs or super-resistant bacteria that are becoming problematic to treat. We simply don't have an uh, antibiotic that can wipe them out. It's estimated that millions of tons of antibiotic compounds have been released into the biosphere over the last 50 years and less than half of these antibiotics were used for the treatment of disease in humans. So where is all this antibiotic waste coming from? Well, some of it's coming from the therapeutic use in aquaculture and in pets. Um, it's also being used in the growth pro promotion and prophylactic use in livestock. You maybe have seen milk you know, being advertised as not having any antibiotics in it, which is a good thing. Um, it's being used for pest control in agriculture, so that'd be um, especially with plants and such. Sanitizers and toiletries and cleaning products. Every time you brought, buy soap that says it's antibacterial, you're contributing to the problem. And then sterilization and culture selection in research and industry. And it's really the first four that are very problematic and that we could um, do something about to cut down on this waste and then hopefully cut down on the prevalence of these superbugs. So the use of antibiotics in animal feed is done to prevent healthy animals from getting sick. This is done usually when they have a very large um, containment of animals and they don't want some disease to come in and wipe out the 1,000 or 3,000, however many animals they have in this very small place. So what happens is that it passes into the waste of the animal and into the soil and into the groundwater, so it ends up entering the human food chain. So you may be drinking at time your um, water, tap water or bottled water, either one, depending upon where it comes from, could very well contain antibiotics. And it's not harmful to you, but the problem is it's helping to breed these superbugs. It exposes more bacteria to the antibiotic, which means that you're killing off the weaker bacteria, which then don't go on to reproduce, and it's only the stronger, more resistant bacteria that continue reproducing. Another source of the waste is improper disposal of drugs. It's not unusual for people with leftover drugs to just throw them in the trash or put them down uh, the toilet. Um, the medical profession also dis discards unused antibiotics, and often these end up in our water supplies. Unfortunately, what most people don't realize is antibiotics can have their activity destroyed before they're disposed of, and then it won't matter if it ends up in the water supply. Again, it's not harmful to us for it to be in the water supply. It's the effect it has on the breeding of the bacteria. Individuals can avoid overuse of antibiotics by trusting their doctor when the doctor says, you know, you just need to get some rest and wait a few more days instead of insisting on an antibiotic. And then when you do have an antibiotic prescription, make sure you finish the entire prescription. And part of that is so that we don't have waste to dispose of, but the bigger issue is if you don't finish it, people often quit taking the antibiotic when they feel better. And then unfortunately, it doesn't wipe out the entire infection. So guess which, which uh, bacteria survive? The strongest, most resistant bacteria survive and go on and multiply. And even though they may not reinfect you, they're out there in the general population. To finish up, then I want to talk about the Tamiflu precursor, or the uh, molecule that led to the development of Tamiflu, because it's a great example of green chemistry being put into practice. Remember, Tamiflu is the only oral antiviral that may be effective against avian flu or the H5N1 strain. And the key precursor for the synthesis of Tamiflu is shikimic acid or its salt, shikimate. And this compound is found in low doses in many plants, so low enough dose that it's not worth going after, 
but the Chinese star anise is a favored source. Shikimate is found in the star-shaped fruit and it can be extracted, but it's a lengthy process with fairly low yields. So there have been worldwide efforts to find other sources for this precursor. So some promising developments which all use green chemistry to uh, harvest this precursor include the production of shikimate from fermentation reactions of genetically engineered bacteria. And you may remember that genetically engineered bacteria are being used to do more and more helpful things for us, such as digesting bacteria, uh, helping to clean up oil spills, all kinds of cool things. Also, harvesting of shikimate from pine needles. Even though the yields are low, several varieties of pine trees work, and it's a very plentiful resource and a renewable resource. The extraction of shikimate from suspension cultures of Indian sweet gum tree, which is an, another inexpensive natural uh, resource. And there are other success stories beyond the Tamiflu precursor in green chemistry that use safer chemicals or solvents, find shorter pathways, use renewable resources, and recycle or treat the waste. And you can read about some of those other medications that have done it in a green way in your textbook. <laughs>